It's been a strange year, everyone. And the COVID crisis has caused many of us to reevaluate everything we're doing while keeping ourselves, our families, and our employees safe. It's with this in mind that we determined we should review this year's nominations and present a special award for COVID response. When we read how our honoree reacted to the initial crisis, we knew that she was the one we wanted to recognize for her above and beyond efforts. So without further ado, please help me in congratulating and thanking Jill Miller, the president of Bethesda Inc. and B3, the winner of the 2021 COVID-19 Regional Response Award. Now last spring, after the pandemic forced community-wide shutdowns and created an extreme economic crisis, the Greater Cincinnati Foundation and United Way of Greater Cincinnati activated an unprecedented cross-sector regional response to address critical community needs. They recognized that the most vulnerable members of the community would be disproportionately affected and they created the COVID-19 Regional Response Fund. The fund prioritized grant awards using an equity lens to address food insecurity, housing, medical care, and child and elder care. It formed a funders collaborative composed of the funders who contributed to the fund and Jill Miller stepped up to chair it. So it was a challenge to get all the funders aligned, but Jill drove the process, ensuring dollars got to the nonprofit community. Those at the table included Buell I-3 and Bethesda, as well as a who's who of regional leaders, like the Deaconess Associations Foundation, Fifth Third Foundation, First Financial Bank, Humana Foundation, the Kroger Company, Zero Hunger, Zero Waste Foundation, Procter & Gamble, Scripps Howard Foundation, Western and Southern Financial Group, Jacob G. Schmidlap Trusts, Skyline Chili, Hearst Foundations, and the Charles H. Dater Foundation. Jill and her team formed a committee of external community representatives from these groups to review and disperse grant awards with a strategy to spread resources to nonprofits with the widest reach to help as many residents as possible. Now, as a result, in just seven weeks, the fund exceeded its goals, raising and awarding millions of dollars in emergency relief to more than 250 local nonprofits serving the region's most vulnerable individuals and their families. So congratulations to Jill, and let's learn more about the impact of these efforts. Jill, thank congratulations, you. and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dustin. It's a true honor uh, to represent our Cincinnati community. Now, amazing things that you were part of this past year, and I want to just talk for maybe about five to seven minutes about them. Um, you know, how did the COVID-19 Regional Response Fund come into existence? And more importantly, how did you get identified for the person to lead this? Within days of COVID-19's arrival, the Greater Cincinnati Foundation and United Way stood up this fund to provide an opportunity for foundations, individuals, and corporations to come together and really help our most vulnerable citizens that we knew would be disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. We raised over $7 million and contributors to this fund formed a funders collaborative to help guide the decision-making process and really keep equity at the center. So why me? <laughs> Ellen Katz from Greater Cincinnati Foundation and Moira Weir from United Way um, understand that my organization, BI3, Bethesda Inc.'s grant-making initiative to transform health, is working to reduce health um, barriers to better health. And they recognize that I have experience with evaluation and awarding grants. More importantly, they asked me to draw on my passion for health equity and to really guide the Funders Collaborative, for which I was truly honored to accept the role. Well, a lot of work, a lot of folks that were involved in this from what I was able to read about. What were the first steps you took to uh, you know, rally the troops and get this going? GCF and United Way took the lead on rallying the community to a cause and serving as a conduit where everybody who wanted to, who wanted to do something right to help people could pull their resources and we could do so in a very meaningful way. We threw out cumbersome processes and really put in a simple way for everyone within our community to um, request funding and try to then deploy those resources very rapidly. That makes a lot of sense. You know, Joe, building such multilateral volunteerism projects and funding in such a short period of time, 
must have been challenging, obviously. Uh, how did you prioritize where to spend your time as well as determine which initiatives were the highest priority to get rolled out to reach those people? One of the things I'm most proud of is that immediately we leaned into our community, organizations, nonprofits, and individuals with lived experience. We don't have all the answers, so it was really important to talk to the people on the ground in the crisis. We invited nonprofit leaders to talk with us each week when the Funders Collaborative met uh, to hear firsthand what was going on and how we could most help. And once everything came to a standstill and people could no longer work, obviously the basic necessities of life became our priority. Food, shelter, emergency child care services, um, senior services, as well as access to care. You know, with so many people trying to achieve such a great mission that was so needed at the time, messaging has to be such a key component to it, making sure that you're communicating with all the right people so that they're all going the right direction, getting things done in such a short period of time. What, how did you develop a, a collaborative message that you were able to communicate people with people to keep them in the loop? From day one, everybody who joined this tremendous effort knew that our mission was to help those disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. I had the privilege of working from my own home. Yes, it was a challenge homeschooling. Um, yes, I missed the normalcy, but I didn't worry about having a roof over my head or putting food on the table or losing my job. And so many in our community didn't have that privilege. And so this Funders Collaborative was committed from day one to helping the most vulnerable. And that was our key simple message to help those in our community who needed us most. Did you have a methodology for communicating with them? You mentioned there were weekly meetings, but uh, was there uh, something that was a recap afterwards or how did you do that? Yes. So we always sent out um, pre-meeting materials, including an agenda and speakers we were going to hear from, from the nonprofit community to stay connected. And then we would meet weekly via Zoom and then send recaps right after for those who maybe couldn't join us or wanted to have that to refer to as they were communicating back to their boards and the, their stakeholders, right, the difference that this fund was making. For example, BI3 was one of the first in. We committed half a million dollars to this effort. And so it was important for me to continue to um, communicate to my board the impact we were having collectively. That's great. Uh, you know, obviously, any one of these kind of initiatives, especially this kind, there was a lot of challenges. You can't meet in person. Um, you're trying to reach people who maybe have, uh, you know, or, 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 you know, disproportionately disadvantaged in different ways, and yet you're still finding ways to work with them. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you had to overcome to ensure success with this? Our biggest challenge was how do we deploy these resources quickly and efficiently in an equitable manner? I know a lot of other funds across the country um, chose to just cut some big checks to big organizations, and we could have done that, right? But we also recognized, in addition to our large nonprofit organizations, the smaller organizations and grassroots organizations are those that our neighborhoods and communities trust and turn to in crisis. So to answer your question, how do you deploy these resources as rapidly as possible to as many diverse organizations who are really on the ground meeting the need? So finally, uh, talk a little bit about you know the results of this. You know, what? How did you uh, measure it? And then, are there plans for twenty twenty one? We purposely wanted this to be easy for our nonprofits. Um, we know the good work that we're doing. These are partners that work with GCF and United Way, and they are our trusted partners. So there's a big piece of trust in all of this. And so we weren't focused on putting a lot of metrics or measures in place, right? I mean, we needed to feed people, we needed to shelter people, um, and we trusted that that was gonna happen. Uh, we did help hundreds of thousands of people through this tremendous effort, wow. from delivering meals to seniors, to providing shelter to um, domestic violence victims, to providing emergency childcare to our um, necessary and, and healthcare workers. So 
I could go on and on, but obviously we don't have time, right? But, you know, we received tremendous feedback from the nonprofits and just how much they appreciated the trust we put in them in serving our community during crisis. Well, Jill, it made a huge impact in the community. I want to thank you for the work and the efforts that you did, as well as all the groups that were part of this collaborative. So thank you and congratulations again. Thank you. I'm so proud that if you think about it, raising over $7 million, distributing that to 230 diverse organizations across the region in seven weeks. That just doesn't happen without collective power and the community will and compassion of the human spirit. And that is what this ward represents.